All right, folks, welcome. I am Paul Pindell. I'm with F5, and we're here to talk about open programmable infrastructure. I want to let my co-presenters introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Dan Daly from Intel. And Chris Murphy from Red Hat. I work in uh, emerging tech in the CTO office of Red Hat. All right, so I, I want to apologize right up front. We've, we've got a dinner at about 7 o'clock, so we've only got about an hour and 45 minutes to talk to you guys today. <laughs> so <clears throat> first off, we want to talk about what is Open Programmable Infrastructure Project, something that we've been working on for a little over a year. Um, and uh, we've got some announcements to go through, some what is it and why uh, is, is it important, and why do we think you guys should uh, care about Open Programmable Infrastructure. We'll probably call it OPI project for short. So if you take a look here, the Open Programmable Infrastructure, OPI, is a standards-driven organization. And we want to make sure that folks understand we're not talking about a technical standards org. We're not talking about an IEEE standard. We're talking about a common framework. Our goal is to create a common framework for these IPU and DPU-like devices. Uh, that we can use to interact with them and interface with them and uh, configure them, provision them, and, and uh, monitor them. So that's the, the goal of what we're trying to do here. And these are next generation devices. They are up and coming devices. Uh, some are in the market today, some will be in the market soon. And they are devices that we're uh, talking about in this talk. You can see links to our website and to our GitHub uh, where you can find all sorts of extra good information. I want to talk about the why. Why is it that we think this is important? <clears throat> and the best way to do that, I think, is with a, a quick story. So around Christmas time this year, uh, we were getting ready, my, my family, to uh, go over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house. We were loading up the family truckster, got it all ready, and my wife came to me and said, have you changed the windshield wipers? They need to be changed. And it was six in the morning, it was dark outside, it was raining, and I didn't want to change the windshield wipers. But I had the windshield wipers, so I went out to change them. And I opened up the package, and out of the package fell 17 different adapters for my windshield wipers. Um, and six, a couple pages of instructions. Um, instructions like, find a penny and use the penny to figure out how wide the arm is <laughs> on your... Um, if it fits inside this slot, then you need to use this set of instructions. If it doesn't, you need to use that set of instructions. And so here I was in the rain, getting wet, trying to uh, change my windshield wiper blades. And I don't know, have any of you seen A Christmas Story? Ralphie, uh, knock your eye out, yes. So I was, like Ralphie's father, um, cursing at the furnace, um, at my windshield wiper blades. and. As I got them done and I, I figured out what was going on and I got the right set on and all that stuff, I said to myself, there's a story here. This is exactly why we're looking for the open programmable infrastructure uh, to become a thing. What if there was just one way to interface a windshield wiper blade with a wiper arm on your car? What if they were all the same? What if there was just one way to do it and it was easy and everybody knew how to do it and there was three steps? and you were done. That's what we're trying to do with these um, different vendors' cards. These cards fit in servers. They, cap they could be in a switch. But how do we interface with them in the same manner across any of those vendors' uh, solutions such that we can get a, a, a set, a level set of functionality out of them? How do we make sure they're easy to provision? How do we make sure we can put security services on them? And how do we uh, get all of that done? So that's the why of what this project started with about a year, 15 months ago, I think it was. We have a couple announcements today. We're really excited about this. We've been, this has been a long, hard trudge to get to today for us. Um, many of us started this not being open source experts and knowing what to do. And today we're excited to announce that OPI is joining the Linux Foundation, has joined the Linux Foundation. We are a, the newest Linux Foundation project. It's been a long process and we're excited to do it. 
and here are the, the members that have, uh, the founding members that have joined. These eight companies, Dell, F5, Intel, Keysight Technologies, Marvell, NVIDIA, Red Hat, and Tencent Cloud. So these eight companies have put their money where their mouth is. They're joining us in this effort to fund this project and make it available. Doesn't mean that's the only way to contribute to this project. There are lots of other folks that are contributing to the project that are doing so by contributing code, contributing their time, contributing resources. And there are several that are in the process of um, becoming members, uh, putting their money where their mouth is, becoming members and supporting this project that way. It, it, took, it took each of us, I think, each of our companies, quite a bit of work to get through the legal hurdles, get through the procurement process, get through the, oh, can we say that in a PR process? Can we, all of that marketing stuff, all of the legal stuff that had to happen to create this project, some companies just didn't get it all done. Um, and they're working on it, and they are, we've heard from others that are interested and are on the process and working to join the project as members. So one of the things that has happened is the IPDK, the Infrastructure Programmer Development Kit, has joined um, the Open Programmable Infrastructure Project as a sub-project. So it has the same governance under the Linux Foundation and the same, it will have the same technical committee and, and all of that. So it's, it's a sub-project within the OPI group. And with that, I'm gonna hand it to Dan. Great, thank you. So starting with that, I wanted to maybe get into, well, what is a DPU? What is an IPU? And I don't think I have enough time. You said we have till dinner, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. we've, got, we've so, got another hour and uh, So instead minutes. of trying to go through the, the tight definition, definition of that, let's start with how they're really different from what we're doing today. So today, if you look at from the one million uh, uh, foot level, you have a CPU that's running some applications and it has devices, it has these peripherals, one of which might be a network, might, you might have some disks, you might have other types of things that you attach GPU to your CPU. The DPU and the IPU, if, if you look at what fundamentally changes, is that instead of that being a peripheral hanging at the bottom of the CPU, it is now an independent entity that is attaching to the CPU over PCIe. And so we create this independence uh, from the CPU so that we can provide uh, services that are programmable, uh, these infrastructure services that uh, allow you to say, well, today I want to push uh, a set of ports, maybe a set of device disks, maybe a set of um, GPUs uh, to the CPU, provide these services uh, you know, uh, program programmatically. And this is a really big change. And so this, this is one of the reasons why we need uh, a group like this is because now that we have you know, made this fundamental shift in the platform, uh, how do we program it? How do we take this newly created control point uh, and make it secure, make it run all the applications that we need to run, and be able to program it? And so in, instead of kind of getting into the really dirty details about that, uh, what exactly these devices do, we can draw a box around it and say, this is a new separate trust boundary uh, from the CPU, and so now how do we get in there and how do we bring up that system? And so to break down the, the three key things that we'll be working on inside of OPI, the first step is to independently boot that system. Bring it up, potentially making sure that all the right security pieces are in place, provision it, give it all its credentials, make sure that it can access all the different pieces that you have. And then once you've brought it up, uh, you wanna operate it. So put the operating system on there, uh, and start to program the little bits and pieces that might be inside of that platform. Some of those bits and pieces might be sort of specific to it being a DPU or an IPU. You might have an accelerator, you might have special networking, you might have some capabilities that maybe you don't normally have on the CPU, but in this special platform, you wanna have some standard interface to go and get at that, you know, that, that new specialness that's, on that, that's a, a, on that IPU or DPU. And then lastly, you know, something that really differentiates this from a regular peripheral is that's running real applications. And sometimes those are those same applications that you used to run the CPU, where you're doing virtualization, maybe you're running open vSwitch, 
maybe you're running something for storage. Uh, some of those applications that used to run on the host have now migrated down into this new environment. And it would be really great if they don't have to change that much when they make that transition into this new environment. And so, you know, if we uh, are successful in sort of standardizing these three things, you know, we will have created a, a ton of value where, you know, people can take their applications that they've developed, bring it to OPI, test them out and see if they work. Or if you're a vendor, you can bring your device, DPU, IPU, or whatever you want to call it, bring it into OPI and see if it, you know, adheres to all the same parameters that we've defined. And so our approach then is not to create some new standard to say, all right, well, this is, you know, uh, run this software stack and you now have yourself a DPU, IPU, whatever. Instead, what we're going to do is try to find a pathway where we can reduce some of these variations that we have. So we started with boot, actually, and we found maybe 100 different ways to boot the thing. And so we want to find a secure way to do it, you know, uh, that, that covers all the right, uh, checks all the right boxes, but, you know, gives us a, you know, a, a very clear way to, to do all of these different functions the same. We also want to start reusing some of the things that we already have on the CPU that we know work. I mentioned Open vSwitch. There's lots of things that we're already doing in network virtualization that we want to reuse. There's lots of APIs that we use. We want to make sure that Kubernetes can run. We want to be able to do the same things we're doing with service mesh. All of these things that we uh, uh, are expecting to be able to run on a CPU should be able to also run uh, on IPU, DPU. And then lastly, you know, we have uh, all of these best practices for say security or for power management or just sort of life cycle management in general, being able to put these new devices into your fleet and manage them as a whole. We, you know, we want to be able to recycle a lot of those same ideas and just reapply them to this new, new platform. Uh, another thing that this platform can, can do is it can have certain, allows you to have certain controls over what's happening on the CPU. And so we want to be able to, when we take those you know, security practices, uh, reapply them to this new environment where you've introduced this new control point. So, uh, uh, you know, this is a picture that we've been using for I don't know, about a year or so yeah. uh, that kind of describes the evolution. If you look on the left, it's sort of the stack up of the cartoon of, of what you're doing when you're doing network virtualization today. And when we move to DPUs and IPUs, we draw that trust boundary line. We chop the system in half and we move a bunch of stuff below. Uh, and so the, the, this, this on the right-hand side becomes our problem space. Because once you've introduced that cut line, you know, uh, what are you doing to make sure that, the, that the, the systems independently are secure? And how are you, you know, able to move those functions that used to be on the CPU, move them down into the IPU and then allow, and DPU, and allow the, the IPU DPU to provide the right abstractions back up over the PCIe uh, and, and back into the CPU. Uh, it, it's, it's all about control, really, as uh, to be able to, uh, one of the common functions that you have in these DPU IPUs is for them to boot the host, to be able to say, uh, I'm going to boot up the infrastructure below first, and I'm going to use that to determine, okay, well, what image should I boot on the, on the CPU? What mechanism should I use to boot the CPU? Should I, should I pixie boot it? Should I pass it a disk that has its, has its image? Uh, it allows you to give uh, you know, the, a, a, a nice bounding box around the CPU. In addition to booting, you can also pass it its I.O. that maybe it, it's been assigned. You know, a lot of these uh, techniques came around uh, the idea of bare metal hosting, to be able to provision uh, you know, an entire system and be able to give it its boot image, give it all of the disks that it wants, all the ports that it wants, all the I.O. that it wants. Uh, and be able to you know, control the speed and the size of all of those devices. Maybe I want to give it a one gigabit port as opposed to a, uh, uh, or a 10 gigabit uh, virtual port. And so these are the types of, these are the reasons why we, we draw that line. Uh, and these are the reasons that uh, you, know, you, you couldn't really do this with a smart NIC because the smart NIC booted up and was part of the, the system. Uh, another really nice side effect of this separation is that 
these new devices do have a whole bunch of special stuff on them to accelerate these common functions. They'll probably have something to accelerate their networking or make their networking programmable. They probably have something to do high-speed crypto to be able to do compression. And so we can, within OPI, create uh, you know, APIs that are specific to those special accelerators and not have to run that special accelerator software on the host itself. We can keep it in the walled garden of the IPU DPU, uh, makes it a lot simpler to sort of standardize and, and make it and, and adopt. So, uh, so, so given that, you know, our, our plan really is to start with a set of common approaches that we see, you know, uh, in the open source and curate, pull down those those pieces that are, are valuable and be able to, to find that that common thread and be able to reduce that, that, that variation down to something where you know, we're supporting the right set of applications and we're making it easy for a, a new vendor or a new um, device to come into the environment and, and run. And these common programming models will make it easier so that you know, we, what we don't want is everyone to bring their own SDK, have their own API, and then, ha and then if, if you're going to try to make sense of this, you have to sort of adopt that vendor's API. Instead, we want to flip it around and say, all right, well, here is the set of software uh, that, uh, that we pulled from the open source that we want to work. And you can be part of this environment if you can support these, uh, these different design decisions that we've made. And that allows you know, that sort of uh, more flexibility in, in both the, the top and the bottom. It allows, uh, if I'm an application vendor and I want to bring you know, my value to this environment, I, I can come to OPI, look at the different interfaces that are being used to, you know, to boot, to program, and to run applications, to look at those parameters and then be able to port my application and know that it's going to run on these different devices that are supported. Separately, as a, as a uh, device vendor ourselves, we really like this because it allows this common framework for, you know, to let our special goodness that might be in our device, our special value add, to come through and uh, not have to you know, worry about how to do all of the baseline functionality. Uh, and so with that, I'll to Chris and... Sure, I just wanna say, none of those cowboy things on those slides were my idea. <laughs> no, like legit, Dan added them. Yep. I was like, hey, this is, this is cool, we got cowboy things. Yeah, I'm a cowboy. Yeah, uh, but th they were not my ideas. I know you were looking at me, Frank, and saying, Chris put those on there, it was not me. Uh. <laughs> So, um, specifics about how our, our group is functioning. So, um, we have different subgroups. We have one main group meeting a week, and then all the subgroups have you know, individual meetings. Some of them are weekly, some of them um, are every other week. Depends on you know, what's going on in that group. Um, but these are sort of what they are. We have an org group that works on just forming and how do we bring in new members and things like that. Um, we have a vision statement group, uh, well, vision group that focuses on, you know, what is the direction of the project? What are we trying to accomplish? And trying to connect vision across some of the technical subgroups and align things, right? Um, outreach and event group um, helps plan things like this, like where we're going to come to an event or some of our uh, virtual events. We had one a few months ago. We will be having more um, events, probably virtual, I think, mm -hmm. in, the, in the coming mm -hmm. months. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely check out our um, project website, and we'll be announcing it on there. Um, but yeah, we plan to go to other conferences and talk about what we're doing. Um, like Dan said, we want to reuse things. Part of reusing things is working with a lot of other open source projects, right? So. In order to go and collaborate, we will be you know, attending other conferences and things so we can collaborate with these other open source communities, right? We don't need to reinvent every wheel. Every wheel is going to end up round, so let's figure out who's already decided <laughs> how to manufacture a wheel and work with them. Um, the orientation group, that's really just me, um, but it's about bringing in new members, you know, getting them access to things and teaching them about um, what we're doing. Um, if anybody wants to help, it doesn't have to be just me. <laughs> um, minimum requirements group, this group is focusing on, you know, what are the features that a piece of hardware needs to have 
in order to work with this group. Now, that wasn't to be exclusive or in trying to keep certain vendors out, but really we needed to define a common base because you can't boil the ocean. So we needed to start with like, these are the features, these are the things that are required as a minimum base in order to work with our project, you know? Um, things that differentiate, you know, this hardware from a um, smart NIC, for instance, you know, being a, having an independent CPU, having enough resource to run an independent operating system, you know, attaching, you know, via a system bus. Things like that are things that the minimum requirements group has defined. Um, those are all published out on our GitHub, so if others are interested in learning, you know, what those minimum requirements are, we have those published. Um, our governance group, so governance group, the first thing the governance group did was try to figure out which um, foundation we wanted to join. We have made that decision, we are here today, we are joining the Linux Foundation. I have never personally launched an open source project before, this has been an adventure and I have learned so much. Yes. And I think we're all thankful <clears throat> that we have resources within our companies that we could ask and helped us. At Red Hat we have a ton of great resources for this but it was still an adventure. <laughs> um, governance has a bunch of other things to accomplish yet. Now that we have joined the foundation, we will have you know, uh, board members, we are going to stand up a technical steering committee, you know, and we have a bunch of things to accomplish around that. Um, so more governance things coming in the near future. Um, open APIs, that is one of our technical subgroups. So the Open API subgroup is um, trying to focus on making an API abstraction layer that will help um, application vendors and software vendors, you know, write to one common set of APIs and be able to swap out the hardware underneath that works, right? So this is very important to a bunch of our customers. We have heard other customers said, yes, I like the idea of this hardware, but if you're going to lock me into a single vendor solution, I'm not coming. You have to do it in a way that I know that I can still be flexible and I can, you know, write my application one time and maybe I need it on this vendor's card for reason X, but over here I want it to run on this vendor's card and I don't want to have to rewrite it every, every time for each vendor. I will say from Red Hat's point of view, that is important to us too. You know, for us when we're trying to look at how we integrate this hardware into um, OpenShift or into Open vSwitch, you know? When you're, look, when you're talking to the Open vSwitch community, imagine if we tried to come to them and we submitted six different patches for how we want to do DPUs for each different hardware vendor. How are they going to feel about that? How is any open source community gonna feel if every single company and every single you know, person who wants to play in this space wants to do it different? the ecosystem just will not thrive, right? We're all believers in open source or we wouldn't be here, right? And one of the beauties of open source is being able to come to a consensus and a, a way of doing this. So open APIs will focus on multiple different areas, everything from networking, storage, security, there's a whole lot of different um, telemetry, monitoring are all subjects that you know that we're looking at like, actually telemetry might be in the provisioning as my provisioning subgroup, sorry. But anyways, um, looking at the different ways we're going to try to create an abstraction and API layer um, for this ecosystem. Um, the use cases subgroup is focusing on defining some, some use cases, taking input from our customers of where we should start, right? There are so many things we can tackle in this space, but defining you know, where we need to start and where the customer demand is for the use cases we go after. Um, that's part of what the use case group is um, defining. And then you know, they can um, push those requirements into the other technical subgroups for like, this is what the customers want to see. This is where we should be focusing. Um, provisioning is um, our third technical subgroup. And this is provisioning and lifecycle management. So this is the group that is focusing on how do you boot the devices? How do you connect to them to do debug? Um, how do you talk between the DPU layer and the CPU layer? How do you connect it into the system? You know, all those sorts of things. How do you do security? You know, um, a lot of this may be reusing existing things because these are not 
new concepts, but how the pieces fit together, defining that, testing that together, and creating a blueprint of a way to do it, that's what we want to accomplish, right? Um, this was something that came up early in DPUs for Red Hat when we were talking to um, some of the system OEM vendors, right? You know, we were saying, hey, we want you to go to market with us, you know, we want to put RHEL on a card or whatever, can you do it on your manufacturing line? And, and you know, I mean, their response was, we can't do this different for every card. Give us one way. If we're going to have to change our manufacturing process, it has to be consistent, right? And there's not consistency today, right? And it's complicated. You know, you've got to read through all these instructions, and there's no easy button. Half the time you can get, you know, something stood up, and then you look at it sideways, and now it doesn't boot anymore. And, you know, I mean, it's complicated. We need to reduce the complexity. Um, and make it easier for our customers or this ecosystem will not thrive, right? I mean, we're really trying in our technical subgroups um, to do the things that will make this new hardware be successful. Mm -hmm. But hardware isn't gonna do anything for you without secure, easy to use, consistent, open source software. That's what we truly believe, right? Yep. And that's why we're all collaborating here, because we believe this. Everything, application vendors, mm -hmm. platform you know, and vendors, um, adapter vendors, telcos, you know, different customers, you know, everybody really believes in the vision, right? Um, what we need is more technical folks to come help us drive this vision. We have so many experts across this you know, industry in different areas, and we're gonna need help from a lot of different folks to engage in our technical subgroups to make sure that we come to the best solutions, right? So our technical subgroups, along with our other subgroups, but we would love more participation. So if any of these groups sound interesting to you, um, oh, the last one, I forgot, POC. Sorry, Steve. Steve leads the POC group, and I almost <laughs> forgot about it. Um, so the POC group is you know, trying to take um, potentially some of the things the other sub technical subgroups produce and you know standing some things up on um, actual hardware showing how some of the pieces fit together you know at first it will be you know simple and over time it's potentially going to grow but it's really about you know showing how the things can work together having some things customers can try out um, putting the pieces together and doing the integration um, if that sounds interesting to you you can talk to Steve <laughs> So, if any of those subgroups sound interesting, um, this is the link on our GitHub to where we have the descriptions of all these subgroups. Um, so it goes into more details about what every subgroup is doing, and it also has um, the subgroup leaders' um, information, their name on there, and you can click on it, and if you join our Slack channel, then you can go, that will send you to the Slack channel, and you can go into the subgroup um, channels and just show up there and raise your hand and say, hey, I would like to be added to the meetings and the subgroup leaders will get you involved. Um, so it's that easy to contribute um, to any of these subgroups. And there may be more subgroups that come up, right? This is just where we're starting today. As more things come up, we may have more. In addition to you know the subgroups, um, OPI is kind of an umbrella, right? And we will have other sub-projects under it. Today, the first um, sub-project that we have officially under OPI is the IPDK um, sub-project. And we expect more, and we, we welcome more. And in fact, currently in the works, NVIDIA is you know, recently officially joining the project and you know, looking at how to contribute DOCA components potentially as a sub-project um, under OPI. Right? Um, but yeah, we expect there to be more um, sub-projects as we go along. So, how to join. I already talked a bit about joining the subgroups. That's one way. You know, you don't have to be a technical person. We can use all kinds of different skill sets. Technical folks also super welcome um, to come and participate in the subgroups. If you have a sub-project that you think, hey, this should really live within that OPI umbrella, we're interested in bringing a sub-project, come talk to us, you know? 
and we'll see if that fits and we think it wants to be you know, a sub-project um, under the OPI umbrella as well. Um, so that's another way. Um, to do any of the technical contributions, you don't need to be a you know, founding member or a premium member. Um, there are other benefits that come to, with if you are one of those. So we'll talk in a minute about how you would join that way as well. Okay, so links, how you get to some of this information. So the OPI project website, um, on that website up in the um, upper corner, there are links to our Slack. Um, you click on that link, you'll get a Slack invite. That is the easiest way to talk to us. There's a main channel in there. Come in there, say hi, introduce yourself, be awesome. Um, let us know, you know you're joining, we can get you invited to meetings. There are also a bunch of channels for all the subgroups. Feel free to join any you want, or if you need help figuring out where you know might be the right place, let us know. Um, so there's that, but also on the OPI project, there is a, a join um, link, and there you could fill out a Google form that will provide us with your email address, your GitHub ID, and we can invite you to meetings, get you in the GitHub, you know, so you can start contributing if you, you know, you're ready and you wanna come join. That's great. IPDK also has their own website and their own GitHub, you know, that you can access to learn more about IPDK specifically and how to contribute there. That's another way. Um, now the Linux Foundation piece. Like I said, there is benefits to being a actual, con you know, paying member of the project, right? You get voting rights, there's different governance things, we have them all you know, documented and we can share. But if anybody is interested in their company officially joining the project, like our eight founding members and more that are in the works, um, we've provided the link here, the enrollment form you can fill out and then you can start the conversation with the Linux Foundation about what it takes and all that. Or if you have questions, reach out to us and we can give you more information on that part as well. All right, one other way to interact with us. We have one more session here. On Thursday, we have a, a panel session or a birds of a feather type session. Here's the information and the link to where it is on the OSS um, schedule, but it's on at noon. Um, various members, not just us, but some other um, founding companies are gonna be there. It's a great place to come, chat with us, learn more, let us know if you're interested challenge us if you want, you know, mm -hmm. um, heckle us, I guess you could if you really want. Um, so that's the information about that session and we would love um, you guys to all come and participate. Now, um, before we do questions, I wanted to ask all of the OPI community members that are here, because there are some members from our other um, participating companies here, if you guys just wanna come up and you know, give yourself a quick introduction in what company you're from, all right, come on, guys. Come on you up. can do this. <laughs> Get the the mic. Hi, I'm uh, Steve Royer, and I, I work uh, with Chris at Red Hat, and I am also the, uh, the, the project lead for the POC and uh, dev platform uh, group. Venkat Pulela from Keysight. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Jan Fischer from Red Hat. Um, I lead our vision and goals group and also our governance group. Um, so I'm working with Chris from the very beginning and Paul as well, so. Hi, I'm Tuvo from Avel Technology. Um, I just, come on in. Um, I just joined two months ago. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So still <coughs> learning my way, but yeah. Obviously, Marvel DPU hope to play a part in this ecosystem. Hi, I'm Laura Hendrickson. Uh, I work for F5 Networks, and I've been working in the background on this project since inception. Just I haven't been. I've been doing threads. <laughs> Awesome. Um, does somebody want to get like a group picture? Maybe Aaron, can you just snap up? Sorry. Let's all get in. Okay. 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 <laughs> oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. 
true. Yeah, it doesn't affect them. This one? Yeah, doesn't work. Yeah, wait, want to be here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Nice. Almost. Of course, you picked the shortest person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can stand on a chair, Aaron. There you go. Oh, nice. Awesome. So, questions, Hugh. I have a question. Yes? Um, so, the interesting thing to me about the CPU and IPU is, I mean, they're computers. I mean, the whole point is that they're really much like computers. Um, do they typically have a management interface like IBM or Red Shift or something like that that you would use to manage them the same way you would a CPU and IPU? So the question for those online was that um, Hugh says DPUs, IPUs, they're interesting hardware, specifically because they are compute, and he's wondering if they typically have a management interface, like a BMC, or do you use Redfish, or like how you know, do you interface with these cards? Not all of them do. I will say that um, uh, to be secure, I would say it is, it is um, what you would want, <laughs> to be able to separately manage you mm -hmm. know, that hardware. Um, Early on, we um, put a stake in the ground that in order to work with OPI, the cards need to have a BMC on them and an ability to do you know, management. And we are looking at Redfish as a, um, a prime um, target you know, for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, the rules may be not as clear cut because maybe the BMC is not on the card, but it's in the server. And you know, so there's a little bit more wiggling as we're trying to figure mm -hmm. out exactly how this is going to work. But yes, exactly. Um, in order to do this securely and stuff, yes, you want to be able to separately manage it. Okay, another question here. Can I ask a yep. Yeah. Um, is there, have you imagined in the specification um, any particular kind of management software for the, for a set of Let's say they have an IPM. Okay, so the question is, have we thought about um, management software? What would we use to talk to the IPMI interface, and does it unify across these devices? Yeah, I would say, I don't know if I need uh, this, but yeah, uh, not, not yet, and, uh, but we know that those are out there. And again, this is a great area to be able to reduce some of the complexity. And you know, uh, I think uh, we look at, let's say, OVS is a great, place where we can all agree that that's a great place to start for networking. On the management side, we're, we're still looking for that sort of obvious uh, choice to, to make so that we're not just sort of building a sort of redfish, you know, bridge to nowhere, but we've tested it with something that, that, that you know, we can agree upon, you know, is, is a good at least reference for, for doing that function because it's definitely required. And to manage at a cluster scale, you know, we're looking at Kubernetes as a, as a way to manage like a cluster of yes. DPUs, mm -hmm. you know, um, or a cluster of CPUs, separate clusters for security reasons, potentially. So those are some of the things we're, we're looking at. Yep. Mm -hmm. Next question in the back. So the question is, are there use cases that are already out in the wild and today or are we still in like a POC experiment phase, you know, going on? Um, if you know anything about AWS Nitro, I would say their architecture is... <laughs> is yeah, bare metal hosting is a great place to start. It's a well-known mm -hmm. use case that many of these DPUs and IPUs are already in production. <clears throat> on bare metal hosting, and then you can sort of build up from there and sort of start to accelerate virtualized hosting. Mm -hmm. And then on top of virtualized hosting, you can start to accelerate Kubernetes, and then you can start accelerating service mesh, start putting yeah. on Firewall. services. Firewalls, uh, yeah, DDoS. And you start to build up from there, so mm -hmm. it, yeah. yeah. It's being so, used in all so those yeah. areas. I, I would say that there are definitely hyperscalers already using um, DPUs and IPU technology yep. um, a lot, um, and but there is, there is a bunch, and there's, 
a whole lot more coming as the hardware has evolved. You know, early hardware didn't necessarily have a ton of compute resources on it. Um, a lot of the adapters that are that are eminent in the market are going to be a lot more powerful, have a lot more CPU, um, memory, all that. There's our timers going off. And yep, in the back as well. We have what, a question online or? Yep. Okay. We have one virtual question, so this will be our last question. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm interested in the project or I'm interested in this project to contribute. Do you have regular team meetings that we can join? Yes, we do. So we have uh, generally, uh, it's Wednesday, 8 a.m. Pacific, I believe. I'm in central time now, so I think that's what it is. Yes. 8 a.m. Pacific, and um, if they want to go to the opiproject.org website, click on the Slack channel. They can join the Slack channel and ask, ask us a question how to get involved and we'll go, go about getting them uh, set up and, and uh, send an invite to them. Yes, and, uh, that's uh, the main meeting and then there are subgroup meetings too. So if, they're more in, if you're more interested in a specific subgroup area, we can also get you connected with that and get you invited to the regular meetings. And Absolutely. The, and the subprojects like IPDK also have their own Slack. They also have their own set of meetings that are scheduled uh, on their, each of their different websites. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are done. More questions, more interaction at our panel session Thursday. On, Thursday. on Thursday. Come join us <laughs> or find us anywhere here um, and we'll be happy to chat. Thanks everybody. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you.